fifth at the Zoom uh, colloquium. Today we will have a presentation by my good friend Alessio Terzi. Before we start the actual presentation, um, I've been asked to give you a little bit of pointers to the next event organized uh, by the TCU Center. So on the 7th of June, there will be a seminar on the PNRR. On the 9th of June, there will be a, a second seminar on the reform of the Reddito di Cittadinanza. And on the 15th of June, it will be the sixth uh, Cisium uh, Colloquium with um, Tommaso Venturini uh, from Geneva University, who will be talking about um, ocean geoengineering for climate change. So this is the agenda going forward. Uh, today, uh, Alessio will be presenting his uh, new book, you can see it here, and a few reflections that then stem from uh, this book. I encourage you to check it up and eventually uh, you know, purchase it if uh, uh, you find it interesting. Um, a few words on Alessio before giving the floor to you. So um, Alessio holds a PhD in economics. Uh, his research focused on uh, the determinants of uh, growth, okay, and how we can causally identify growth. We actually have been colleagues for a very short uh, amount of time. We first met at the Hertie School of Governance, uh, where he did um, his PhD. And after the Hertie School, or during your Hertie School period, actually, you went for a Fulbright scholarship uh, at Harvard, um, where you worked with uh, some prominent scholars there, including Danny Rodrik, among others. And then um, also during your PhD, if I'm not mistaken, um, you had a research uh, position at the European Central Bank, uh, um, developing an index of European integration, which I still uh, time to time use, is actually one of the most useful resources on European integration I've found over the years. Um, what else? Today, Alessio is a researcher at uh, the European Commission and also has his own independent agenda uh, to you know, explore the challenges of humanity, let's say. Um, and this book, I think, uh, represents well a good part of uh, his thinking. But without further ado, I will let you the floor for about 40 minutes. Thank you, thank you, Francesco, for uh, for the introduction and for the for the invitation. Thank you, Stefano, for the invitation as well. Thank you for being uh, um, here today in this wonderful venue. I am told that there is a bit of a rivalry between uh, Polytechnico and uh, ETH in Zurich. I was in Zurich uh, on Friday last week, and I can tell you that these facilities uh, have. Uh, uh, or no uh, inferior at all uh, to what I have seen on the other side of the Alps. Um, so indeed, I'm going to talk for roughly 40 minutes, something like that, and then give or take, and then we can. Uh, I'm going to have a bit of a conversation with with Francesco, but ideally with you as well. So I hope I can uh, um, prod some reflections on some of these some of these topics. Um, there is a book, um, and I just wanted to give you some details, not so much so that you can buy it up front, um, but rather to tell you two things. Um, the first is that this is a trade book, uh, and incidentally it is my first book, uh, which means that as a, as a first time author I didn't know what a trade book was. And I discovered uh, that in the language of publishers, trade book implies that it is a book written for wide audiences. So what this means is that this is not a, a macroeconomics textbook on climate change, but rather a reflection uh, that hopefully is appealing to many that are reflecting on aspects related to climate change, the economy and society, uh, and how all of these uh, come together. And the second piece of information, uh, Francesco already said it's a, it's a recent book. I am told that books have a shelf life of roughly one, for one year, they're still considered new. And so this book hasn't celebrated its first birthday yet, uh, which, uh, which makes it a, a, recent, uh, a recent book, uh, because it, it came out just before the summer. Um, and the second piece of information I wanted to attract your, information, your attention to is that it is roughly 200 pages long. And you could tell me, but there it says 368. And the trick lies in the fact that to keep it um, simple, to read, uh, and yet at the same time rigorous, the book is sort of split in two parts. Uh, the main text is something that I have forced even my mother to read, and she survived, and she's not an economist, so it's sort of proof of the fact that uh, uh, it can be read um, without requiring a PhD. 
uh, in economics. And everything else, for those of you that are looking for more technical references, is all buried in the endnotes. So there is roughly a third of the book that is devoted to endnotes, fo footnotes, bibliography, and so if you are keen, uh, that's where you will find all of this. So um, I've given, I've lost count of how many of these presentations I've given, but I've realized that a good trick to, to give you a sense of what the book is about is to tell you a few words on, uh, on its genesis. And this is very much, people were talking of pandemic babies as babies that were born out of the, of the pandemic era. And I guess this makes it a bit of a pandemic brainchild because this is a, a book that was conceived during uh, the lockdown uh, time. If you remember, and I'm sure uh, you still remember those early days, we had a new virus, um, there was no vaccine, there was no treatment, so governments around the world sort of decided in favor of lockdown measures, uh, as they were called in Italy, confinement, as they were called in Belgium, where I live, uh, stay-at-home orders, uh, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, uh, and so we were stuck at home, and everything was going bad, in a way, in the sense that the, the public health situation was bad, um, people were dying, effectively, intensive care units, um, and from an economic point of view, uh, for people like me looking at the macroeconomy, um, everything was going bad as well, in the sense that people were stuck at home, consumption was tanking, as a result, uh, GDP was, uh, was tanking, and uh, for those that were looking for a silver lining, uh, this came in the form of uh, uh, what, um, what media was calling at some point nature is healing. So this idea that on a set of environmental and climate indicators we started to see an improvement. So uh, the quality of air started to improve, the quality of water started to improve, uh, CO2 emissions uh, dropped. Uh, at some point uh, some uh, pictures of dolphins in the canals of Venice were shown. Um, I was in Venice actually uh, two days ago, and they were telling me that indeed there were octopus uh, that were spotted in the Canal Grande, but no dolphins to be seen. Uh, so the pictures with dolphins proved to be fabricated later on, but the, that was a bit still the, the beginning of a reflection that is what the book is about, which is to say, could it be, even once COVID is long gone, or once we have vaccines, treatments, and we're not going to use lockdown measures, for that end, or to that end, could it be that because we need to improve our relationship with nature, we need to improve on these environmental indicators, and we know that we need to bring down CO2 emissions, could it be that we need to shrink the size of the economy as part of the toolkit to address climate change? Now, um, this uh, sort of uh, generated uh, uh, a trinity, a holier and holy trinity, depending on where you stand on this debate. Um, and this is what the book is all about. So it is a reflection on the relationship between the economy and nature. As soon as you start thinking about the economy, you rapidly shift to economic growth. And so it's the bottom part of this slide. And then you, you sort of, as soon as you start reading about these things, you're, you're sort of compelled to add an extra layer which is the way the economic system is currently organized around, let's say, capitalistic principles. And this is what, where the Trinity comes from. And the book, if, if Francesco had told me you have five minutes to, to talk about the book, this is where I would stop, because this slide contains everything that the book is about, and it is essentially a reflection on the interplay between these three dimensions, which means what is the relationship between economic growth and nature? Can we have so-called green growth, or is growth a problem? What is the relationship between growth and capitalism? To some people, we should, uh, let's say, enter into a sort of steady state economy, but that is not, uh, wouldn't have uh, extremely consequential effects for our society, so we would continue having sort of the economic system we have, just uh, having flat uh, growth. To others, capitalism and growth are sort of uh, crucially intertwined, and so you cannot give up one without giving up the next. And finally, it's a reflection on, on the relationship between capitalism and nature. For some people, uh, we should, uh, let's say, green capitalism. This comes uh, in the form of uh, things you might have read in, in newspapers, whether we call it ESG capitalism, responsible, green capitalism, or whatnot. 
For others, it is the system itself that feeds on nature. And so it is impossible to sort of do good to nature while remaining within this system. The first part of the book, uh, really the first uh, few chapters, are a reflection on this first uh, link. And what I try to say up front is, look, there are some characteristics. I, I try to define what capitalism is, what are the basic elements of, of the system. Um, and there are indeed, I argue, some elements of the system that sort of rekindle a, a quest for growth or a growth momentum. Uh, and I don't want to jump to any conclusion in the first part of the book, um, but rather I use this to say, look, I often speak, I try to go outside of uh, the usual uh, settings, I don't speak only to economists, and to a variety of people, I speak to an in particular natural scientists, of, often people that are really genuinely concerned about the environment or fighting climate change, and uh, you know, we're talking all things climate, and they tell me, you know, we need a list of things, we need to invest on renewables, we need solar, we need wind, we need a more circular economy, uh, and so on. And by the way, we also need to get rid of economic growth. So all uh, this is meant to do is, is to sort of uh, send a, a warning shot to say, look, when you are telling me we need to get rid of economic growth, if the two are, intertwined, or are tightly intertwined, you're telling me that we need to sort of dismantle the economic system in the way it is conceived right now, which is all fine and good, but it's not something that you can just drop at the end of a long list of things we've got to do. You have to come forward with an alternative blueprint of how you would design society or the economy, and then we discuss and we see if this is a good or a bad way of going about it. And this goes along also discussions I have with my students that tell me we need a system change rather than climate change, all good. I am absolutely open to discuss system change, uh, but then let's discuss that and not just call for, for you know, fucking the system and not the climate. Um, while, uh, while writing this book, I realized that, or actually I knew that, economists are often despised among uh, social scientists. Um, for a variety of reasons, and I feel that one of the reasons uh, for that is that we tend to be extremely inward looking. So we read our own literatures, and generally we don't uh, venture outside of it. Many people don't, some do, some good researchers do. And the result, the joke goes, is we write a paper, we publish a paper in economics, and we're proving some type of relationship, but as a matter of fact, sociology was writing about it 100 years ago. But we don't know this because we don't read that literature. And I was trying to shy away from or move away from this paradigm, also because the things I was reflecting on um, have been discussed in a variety of settings, in a variety of domains, in a variety of literature. So I was drawing on everything I could find that goes from uh, history and economic history to anthropology, to, to sociology, uh, even to uh, cultural evolutionary biology, uh, philosophy to a certain extent. The things I'm discussing about, or I was trying to get to, um, relate to this idea of whether we need material goods or we should focus on non-material things like friendship and love and culture. These type of discussions you find in Plato 3,000 years ago. And what this suggests is that there is a throve of, of, of information out there and of literature that I was trying to draw on from. At some point I had to draw a line uh, for my mental sanity and also because my editor was sort of pushing me to, to get the book done. Um, but there is a lot of, of it in there. And so again, I reiterate, this is not an economics book per se, because there's a, there's a lot in it. And the second realization was that actually, even within economics, there was a narrow set of scholars uh, falling outside of mainstream, but nonetheless present, that for decades had been uh, sort of reflecting on these uh, issues. They fall under different names, whether it is degrowth scholars, eco-socialism, steady-state economy advocates. Uh, but what they argue is sort of similar in the inception to what I just told me, told you, as in there is indeed a tight relationship between growth and capitalism. But where we start departing is to say, no, actually we need to get rid of growth because we need to get rid of growth. We need to get rid of capitalism as well. Um, 
in doing that, um, it's fine because people are sort of obsessed with this idea of more and wanting more uh, because they are um, victims of the iron cage of capitalism. And so because capitalism forces us through its evil tricks, whether it is advertisement, whether it is planned obsolescence or whatnot, it forces us to consume more when actually people would be uh, totally fine with, uh, with doing with less. Um, and so we get, get rid of capitalism and growth, we focus on nature, there will be less around, but that is fine because people will sort of embrace this uh, scarcity as voluntary scarcity, and there will be more sharing. So we will share what is left uh, while reconciling ourselves with nature. Um, the policy conclusions of this uh, reading of the world are several. The first is that in a way we need to abandon economic growth and hyper-consumerism in rich countries. So it's a message that is very much targeted to rich nations uh, based on the realization that you cannot go to people in, uh, in, uh, in effectively in deep poverty uh, in third world countries and just say you, you're not gonna have growth. So you should allow them to grow and develop and provide for the poorest of the poorest um, and in a way, the, the shrinking economy of the rich countries will open up space for the growing developing world. Uh, this is not a literature that is necessarily against uh, innovation. But what they would say is we've sort of um, done a devolution of innovation to the forces of capitalism. And instead, uh, and we end up with useless stuff. Um, I'm paraphrasing uh, their point of view. Um, and instead, we should be doing uh, centralized innovation. So we would need a very strong government that sort of says, if this is the priority right now, we do research and innovation in this uh, priority, whether it is green transition or whatnot. In a way, uh, there are places uh, that are called eco-villages. I don't know if you know what eco-villages are. They, they are actually places that exist in in Europe, in uh, North America, and South America. So there's small communities of people that come together and have sort of embraced some of these principles, have given up uh, the capitalistic organization of society, engage in basic trade, have some sort of barter, uh, local barter economy, produce locally, have direct or collegial democracy. So the view is, is that we should sort of scale up to society what is happening in, in small eco-villages. And the book, crucially, I feel that many of my colleagues in economics often dismiss all of this as nonsense. And so they just say, this is nonsense, I'm not even going to engage with this type of literature or this type of discourse. Um, and instead, I, I really try to devote uh, one full chapter at the beginning of the book to analyze uh, alternative visions of an alternative potential society in an object, as much as possible in an objective way before coming to some different conclusions. And, and I wanted to understand why I didn't think that this was gonna play out uh, uh, in the way that it is described or why I don't think that this is the best way to try and tackle the, uh, the challenge, environmental and climate challenge we have ahead of us. And I think the, the, the initial point of departure comes from the last point I, I had mentioned uh, uh, in, in the degrowth slide, which is this idea that uh, there will be less and that people will give up uh, uh, this desire for more and that there will be more sharing. And, uh, and rather, I try to make the point in the book by drawing on, on a variety of, of literatures, of examples and so on, to say, look, in an environment where resources are scarce, um, redistribution becomes actually harder. It doesn't become easier. Um, and so you risk exacerbating clashes, social clashes within societies or between societies even more, over limited resources. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, a classic example you could give is to say, look, uh, economic growth has been stagnant in some settings, in some areas of the world especially before the, the Industrial Revolution, in those settings, if you think of a feudal uh, Europe, let's say, it's not like there was this uh, very developed welfare state where resources were flowing from the, uh, from the rich to the poor, and to the extent that there was redistribution, it was uh, not in that direction, but it was rather from the poor to the rich or from the less powerful to the more powerful. And the reason for this, uh, which again is, is, the, is really the, the central element of, of departure to my mind, is to say this desire for more 
is not an imposition of the system. Bear in mind, so of capitalism, on otherwise indifferent people. When I say desire for more, bear in mind that I'm not meaning wanting five cheeseburgers uh, because you can afford them rather than one, or wanting 12 phones uh, just because you can afford them, but rather it links to a desire of, of improvement to a certain extent, so of more as in better, and what I argue in the book is that to a certain extent this desire for better or betterment is something that is uh, rather inbuilt in, uh, in humans. And that as a matter of fact, you could interpret the whole arc of human history as the interplay between this desire for improvement and the development of technologies and know-how to get more of the things we wanted more of. Um, you know, you could interpret the fact that we started using fire uh, to this end, the fact that we developed uh, clothing in order to move to higher latitudes, we developed um, uh, sailing so that we could uh, trade and we could fish, um, and that is our sole superpower to a certain extent, in the sense that had I asked you if we were to fly back uh, uh, for a second to 500,000 years ago and I were to ask you, pick one animal that is going to make it to the top of the food chain, believe me, it would not have been us. Uh, we're not particularly fast. We're not particularly, we don't have sharp teeth. We don't have claws. We don't have fur. Um, I was watching a documentary on the house cat on Netflix a few days ago, and it shows these things like, you know, it, it, it's an animal that can jump six times its height. If you could do that, you would jump over a giraffe. Um, you can, uh, the reflexes are faster. So in terms of physical capabilities, we are not particularly impressive. And the only thing that is a bit our superpower to a certain extent is this ca capability of coming together as groups, developing knowledge, know-how, transmitting it within groups, and, uh, and using this knowledge in the service of things we want more of. To a certain extent, this is a desire of self-determination. So of not say, taking nature as it is and saying, look, these are the endowments that nature gave me, and so I'm not fast, I'm not, uh, I can't swim that well, and so on, so I just take, uh, that is what I get, and uh, we operate with what we have, but rather we develop technologies in the service of, uh, of, of determining our future. To a certain extent, you know, you could stretch the fact that we do incredible feats. We set ourselves some limits and we try to, to smash these limits, which is a characteristic of humanity or to a certain extent exclusive to humanity in this, uh, to this extent. One word on growth and nature, which is obviously crucial to the overall book, uh, even though I don't have that much time that I can devote to this. What I try to say there is, look, Growth is not something that started recently. Growth is not something that started with the Industrial Revolution. It is not something that started in the moment in which we started burning fossil fuels. Um, and rather, to a certain extent, fast growth, uh, perhaps, is something that started with the Industrial Revolution, but there have been episodes of fast growth uh, before. Uh, growth interpreted as the interplay, as I was saying, of technology and the production of, or the servicing of needs and wants, uh, effectively stretching the boundaries of possibility. Uh, this is important because it tells us that a different growth mod model is possible, while at the same time realizing that right now we live in a fossil fuel civilization. Everything we do, you probably know better than I do, um, that everything we do is uh, solidly anchored in uh, the uh, production or burning of, uh, of fossil fuels or the production of, uh, of greenhouse gases, which means that a different growth model is possible, but not that this is going to magically happen. We actually ha have to work for it. The overarching conclusion of the book is to say, look, um, to a certain extent, we're going to have to use uh, once more the one superpower we have, uh, as I was describing it, which is the development of new technologies of innovation and know-how in the service of the need of the moment, which to, to a certain extent right now is improving our relationship to na with nature, intended, intended in loose terms, or decarbonizing our economy, uh, or improving its circularity, and so on. Um, and so to my mind, we will be using uh, this one thing that we're good at um, to achieve that goal. Capitalism within this framework has many problems, 
uh, as a system, in particular it has problems related to inequalities, on its own it has a tendency, a, a centripetal tendency to accumulate capital in the hands of few or effectively to, to, to generate uh, strong inequalities, which is why you constantly need policies to try and compensate this, whether it is competition policy, whether it is redistribution and so on. So we're constantly struggling on that dimension, but if there is one thing that it is uh, good at, it is fostering innovation. And so what I wonder in the book is, are there ways, uh, rather than dreaming of uh, smashing the system uh, with all the societal soul searching that would follow, are there ways in which we can reorient the system towards our needs? So this is not a call to say, sit back, relax, everything is fine, and the magical forces of capitalism are going to solve the day. They will not. Uh, but rather, if we do the right things to try and orient the system in a certain direction, it can actually prove to be uh, an ally in, uh, in fighting the climate fight and reaching the goals that we have set ourselves in terms of decarbonization. There is, of course, a lot that governments can do to this end. To a certain extent, and there is a discussion about that, there's a discussion on carbon pricing, there's a discussion on regulation, there's a discussion on industrial policy, on public investment. There's a lot that governments can do. But I, it does not stop at that. And as a matter of fact, often I give this presentation in places like Brussels or Washington, uh, very policy cities where everybody's obsessed about what governments can do and the latest piece of legislation. And of course, I reiterate, there's a lot that governments can do, but it does not stop at that. And so the green transition cannot happen just because people like me uh, sit in Brussels and from there they sort of do a top-down uh, uh, transition. We need governments uh, on board, but we need also businesses on board. And there is a discussion about that. And there is crucially a discussion on what citizens can do, which are also consumers, which are also employees often. And so they can foster change from within. And that's why I talk of something that is closer to a whole of nation approach rather than a policy agenda to reach a green world. To my mind, what we have ahead of us is something, I became in the process of writing the book, I became very fond of, uh, Francesco knows, I became almost obsessive with economic history. And the reason for that is that I look, I scout in history and economic history for lessons of previous eras that we can use to sort of educate ourselves on the challenges that we have ahead of us and, and try to use them also when planning policies to achieve our goals. And to my mind, we are right now at the cusp of something that resembles an industrial revolution in green flavor. And the reason why I say this sort of links to what I was saying before, which is because everything is linked to greenhouse gases right now, the whole of production, the whole of consumption, transport, housing, agriculture, and so on, it means, and we want to reach net zero, it means that we're trying to transform completely our economy. And there are precedents in history for similar scale of transformations, and these are uh, coincide with industrial revolution. One important point to note is that when these things happen, some countries, some companies, some uh, skill sets, some nations emerge as winners because they manage to crack the technologies that are going to power the future economy. Others remain stuck in technologies that will be rapidly perceived as old, antiquated, lower quality, uh, and, and you end up being on the loser side. And that is something that is important to keep in mind. Another way to, to look at this is, uh, is, of course, um, what we're trying to do is not only an industrial revolution, but an industrial re revolution against a timeline. So we don't have all the time in the world. The first industrial revolution, depending on how you measured it, took 80 years at least to sort of spread to, to market capacity. The second industrial revolution as well, more or less, we don't have 80 years. We have 30 years, more or less, at least given the goals that we've set for ourselves, which means that we are doing an industrial revolution against a timeline, and we're using policy tools to speed up the technological transition that comes with that. Um, and in this setting, there, there is one book that I found particularly interesting, that is the only book I will mention aside from my own, uh, which is by this um, late professor, Calestus Juma, who used to be at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And what he did is to look at uh, innovations of the past. 
and, uh, and try to understand why did a certain innovation spread and spread quickly in one setting, but then maybe it took much longer in another setting? Why did the printing press spread uh, or was developed at some point in Europe, but then it took 300 years more for it to spread in the Islamic world? And he does that across multiple technologies, multiple civilizations and moments, and he comes to this conclusion, which is to say where there are large swathes of people that are at risk of losing out because of a new technology, or they perceive that they are at risk of losing out. So perception and reality are sort of intertwined at this stage. They will oppose the new technology. It is of no avail or no use to say this is in the interest of society overall, this is in the interest of your children, of your grandchildren, or whatnot. It does not work. And what this means is that I often speak to engineers like you uh, and others, uh, but like some of you at least, and others who tell me the, the, challenging, the challenges associated with a fast transition. They tell me, look, we need to ramp up production of, uh, of solar panels or the installation of onshore wind, offshore wind, and there are technical challenges with that, and they are very real and serious. What I'm saying here is there are social challenges that are proceeding in parallel, and to a certain extent, we, not, we have to manage that because if not, there will be sort of, they will be pulling a break, a social break on the speed at which you can uh, roll out uh, innovation. <laughs> and so the policies to fast track uh, the green transition have to proceed hand in hand with the social policies to keep everybody on board and imagine a role in uh, the future green economy. This is sort of what I already told you. Um, and, and one word I wanted to spend um, is uh, on this idea of the green industrial revolution. Uh, and uh, the reason why I want to spend a word is that this uh, leads me into fights with some of my fellow macroeconomist colleagues who at the end of the day look at the green transition in a different way. And this also gives you a sense of the fact that also within, uh, among economists we often fight, uh, actually more often than not, and some of, what some of my colleagues say is the following, which is, at the end of the day, we need to do this green transition because we need to, uh, but uh, it is not an investment opportunity. To a certain extent, it represents high costs up front, but at the end of the day, you're getting the same service out of it. If you think about it, it's a bit like saying, ah, the electric vehicle costs more than the internal combustion engine right now, but at the end of the day, it does the same thing, which is drive you from point A to point B. So I'm paying more to get the same service. So at the end of the day, this is not an industrial revolution. It's, it's a cost that we've got to face, but it's a cost. Uh, or uh, a necessary evil to a certain extent, like uh, military expenditure. And also it creates stranded assets because we've, we have uh, this fossil fuel civilization. So we're sort of giving up all of these things. Now, to my mind, and so they tell me, Alessio, this parallel you do with, uh, with uh, industrial revolutions is, uh, is wrong. To my mind, as a matter of fact, we look at past transitions, including energy, energy transitions of the past, by saying, obviously, the new technology was much more productive, much more efficient, and so, obviously, those were the productivity-enhancing transitions, while ours is not, and it's in a different league. I want to, I'm borrowing here from a paper by Roger Fouquet, who used to be at the London School of Economics, now he's in Singapore. And what he does is he looks at energy transitions of the past. He does so, again, across a variety of, uh, of, uh, of, of transitions, whether it is residential coal to gas and heating, animals to steam, steam to electricity, and so on, to say, look, all of, in all of these settings, we assume right now that the new technology was much more productive, much better, than the previous alternative, but as a matter of fact, at the beginning, they were not. And the reason for this is that actually it requires a big investment up front, and then improvement, and then eventually the new technology becomes cheaper, and when it becomes cheaper, it gets rolled out uh, throughout society. To give you an example of, of from the previous line, from the first line of the previous slide, so the transition from residential coal to gas and heating, if we look at London, which is what he does in, in that paper, how did it happen? It happened because of an environmental shock to a certain extent, the so famous great smog of London, of, uh, of uh, the, basically a time between uh, the 5th and the 9th of December 19, 1952. For environmental reasons, 
or meteorological reasons, the, the weather was such that air was stagnant, everybody was using coal uh, in heating diesel for cars, and effectively this generated a thick smog where you, whereby you couldn't see more than one meter out. People died to the extent of 10 to 12,000, depending on the estimate, within three days. To give you an extent, 100,000 had respiratory problems following that. This was a great shock. What it means is that people who could afford it, those more well off, started to see coal as a, a, an inferior option because it was dirty, because it required storage at home, whatever it was, and they started seeing methane as superior. Methane at the beginning was extremely expensive. There was no infrastructure. There was nothing. So richer households started to effectively adopt the new technology, which was expensive. As they were doing that, it started, they started laying out the infrastructure. At some point, the new option became the better option, the cheaper option, and that's when you sort of saw the, the, the transition happen for everybody, progressively. Likewise, another case study on steamships. We assume that the steamship is obviously faster and better and more productive than the previous one. As a matter of fact, the first steamships were uh, so inefficient, the engine was inefficient first, so they were very heavy, and second, there was no infrastructure, so you had to load your ship with a lot of coal because you couldn't find coal that you would reload along the, the path, which meant that the initial steamships were not more productive, they were not much faster, and they were not better than the new alternative, and rather, because there was an initial investment, it then became better. Which means that um, even if we look at the Industrial Revolution per se, even in Industrial Revolutions, initially, in, if we look at the first Industrial Revolution, effectively, yes, we had the steam engines, and we had the, the more massive use of coal and mecha mechanization, but the, fir the factory did not exist. If you do not have a factory and you have the steam engine, you don't know how to use it. Or you, don't, you have mechanized cotton spinning, but you don't, you don't have sort of the, the, the box to, to use this thing and scale it up. So initially, there are papers that show productivity was not higher. The same thing for the second industrial revolution. On the surface of it, what, what was it? It was a transition from steam to electricity. Is it better? It is just one, okay, you're using one energy source for another, what, what does it change? Nothing, but actually it changes because it then allowed in a secondary wave of innovation to move from the line shaft, which is what the picture shows you on, uh, on the right, to effectively the assembly line. So you could rearrange machinery inside the factory to improve uh, immensely productivity. And therefore it means that you have to look out for secondary waves of innovation. I feel that a lot of people are considering the green transition a sort of an end of technological history. We're doing this transition from one energy source to another, and that's the end of the story. But as a matter of fact, there are huge, to my, to my mind, and I'm not alone in this, um, there are huge scopes for secondary innovation. Um, to a certain extent, because we had been improving, and well, you and, or people in this university and others, Engineers had been improving on the internal combustion engine, for example, or on fossil fuel alternatives for two centuries. And so we were probably sort of entering into decreasing returns to scale, whereas with the, with the new um, energy sources, uh, there are, there's probably a new era of high productivity ahead. To a certain extent, we're already seeing energy costs being lower uh, than the fossil fuel alternative with solar, with wind. And this, again, the fact that we are sourcing new, with new energy sources, we have a cheap energy, is sort of boosting productivity across the economy. I feel the, the sight of Francesco on, on my back as I approach the end of the presentation. There is a lot more in the book, which obviously I couldn't uh, go into. But there is, uh, to a certain extent, just to give you a flavor of, of what you will find, or what you would find if you were to, to buy or read the book, is uh, in the first part, there is also one chapter that is devoted to this discussion on, okay, what is actually economic growth? Is it exactly the same thing as GDP? Um, does it, uh, to a certain extent, how does this relate to well-being? You know that there are a lot of discussions on moving beyond GDP or GDP measuring stuff that we don't really care about. 
Um, and so there's a, a wide discussion on that, and again, we can go more into the details of it, uh, and a bit also the interplay between economic growth and, and liberal democracy. I have given you a presentation that makes me sound like I'm uh, traveling at uh, 50,000 miles uh, from Earth, uh, uh, talking about evolutionary biology, the invention of fire, or what not. As a matter of fact, the book is, uh, has that, and there is a historical dimension to it, but it's also quite practical. In part, reflecting my double or triple personality as someone that works uh, in a policy institution, but at the same time also affiliated with universities, uh, in contact with think tanks, so I, I constantly change hats, and this is reflected in the book. And one of these practical chapters is a zoom in on Italy, uh, taken as an example of a country that, not by policy design, but uh, sort of by accident, has entered into a sort of steady state environment, as you probably know or have realized, as in a country that entered into stagnant growth, uh, uh, economic growth in per capita terms over the last three decades. Uh, and the reason why I use Italy as a case study is to say, look, uh, I, I sort of show what are the negative dynamics that are unleashed in the moment in which you enter into this steady state environment, in particular, if you are alone in doing this. So if other countries continue powering ahead and you uh, do not. Um, and so there are, there's a reflection on that. There is a reflection, speaking of uh, other countries, of course, you know, climate change is, uh, has a global dimension to it. And very often I, I hear people, and rightly so, tell me it's a global problem, it requires a global solution. Now, there, the, the, I could not shy away from having one chapter on this aspect, and in particular what I try to say is, what can we credibly expect in terms of cooperation between countries in the face of climate change? To many people, uh, climate change represents a common challenge, and therefore a bit like a common foe uh, in, uh, I'm a great fan of, of these, uh, these uh, science fiction movies, so it's a bit like uh, the aliens coming in Independence Day. So we have a common enemy, humanity joins forces and fights the common enemy together. As a matter of fact, in this chapter I say, look, there is scope for international cooperation, but it is not going to play out exactly that way, and because of it, uh, we shouldn't expect uh, humanity to join forces uh, anytime soon. As you have realized, uh, innovation uh, is uh, central to my uh, way of looking at things and how we will uh, attack the problem of, of climate change. Um, and there is a discussion there uh, precisely on how innovation comes about. And uh, I am often accused, I'm already going to say it up front, that often people tell, accuse me of this uh, nasty word that is uh, techno-optimist, uh, techno-optimism which is to say, ah, you're, you're wait, well, they would say, you are this uh, optimis optimism prophet, and your church is one that waits for a technology god to appear and magically save the day, um, which makes innovation sound like, uh, like something that happens very much by accident, uh, like a bit of a randomic process, and so if we're lucky, a new technology pops up, uh, and then it helps the, uh, save the day, and if we are unlucky, then it does not. And what I try to argue in the chapter is that actually uh, it is much more of a deterministic uh, feature uh, rather than aleatory process, and that innovation responds to the needs of the moment. And if the need of the moment it becomes uh, uh, decarbonization or decarbonizing, it will respond to that. To a certain extent, you could argue that the development of, uh, of mRNA vaccines uh, for COVID is a bit the reflection of that, as in to say, when something becomes a global priority or an immense priority, funds uh, and attention or get funneled to the priority of the moment, and that's when uh, innovation breakthroughs are made. And finally, I've given you a story that is very much along the lines of, yeah, we need government, we need business, we need uh, citizens on board. There is a chapter that discusses what that means. So I don't keep at that abstract level, but I'm not gonna say what's in there, uh, because if not, it would be a spoiler to the, to the movie, to the book. Thank you very much.
thanks Alessio for, uh, as usual, excellent presentation. Um, so the two of us have the chance of uh, discussing very often um, on these and other topics. So I'm not going to uh, pester you too much with questions, also because I can ask them separately in different occasions. But I'm still going to ask you um, three or four points um, before moving to open a discussion uh, for the audience. So first off, let's, let me start from this latest point you had on innovation. Since we are in a technical university, this is a key um, topic of interest. Uh, um, now, uh, in, in, your, in your book and in the presentation you gave us, uh, there is a very strong idea that at some point, uh, indeed maybe a little bit of techno-optimism, capitalism um, will deliver innovation. But if we think about it, of course capitalism delivers innovation when innovation rewards capital, when savings are rewarded uh, by developing new, new um, you know, products, services, and so on. But the needs of uh, uh, climate change are not something that will um, you know, create demands for specific goods or services right now. There might be a reward for capitalism, but it's very further in time. So how can capitalism, how can capital deliver this type of change when, uh, um, yeah, I can give you this, mm. when uh, um, the reward is not apparent? And maybe the state needs to step in then. Um, so if that's the case, then I would like you to reflect a little bit on how you place your work in relationship to Mazzucato's work, for instance. But if you have a different way of understanding of the economy, uh, then it would be interesting to hear more about this. Um, second question also related with technolo technological change. Uh, a huge debate when we observe the trajectories of new technologies is always uh, when to stop investing in innovation and when to start adopting. Now there is always a trade-off between the two because at some point you may think that uh, spending on adoption deters innovation. So when, when is the moment we have to start to, you know, using um, the technology we are developing and stopping developing uh, better and better ones. Um, uh, maybe I leave it there for the two questions on technology and then I move to uh, deeper philosophical issues. Okay, but I would like to open the floor if, uh, 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 for uh, further questions and uh, then we can... Uh All good. Thank you. Um, just three quick, uh, quick questions. The first one is that we are talking about green growth, but we need to have growth to begin with. So I was wondering what would be your take on the current growth stagnation? So there are different opinions on that, and I was wondering what's your take on it? The second thing is about the sailing ship effect. So yeah, we actually do see it also now. I mean, for example, in the automotive engineering, we do see that uh, cars are getting better as they are introducing the new stuff. Um, but the more um, eco-friendly stuff, the current carbon um, is getting better. But the problem is that is it taking too long for it to take place? Like, what's the issue there? And the third uh, and final question is regarding uh, experimental evidence. I mean, of course, it's the very nature of the field, right? You cannot do many experimental uh, stuff. You just have some thought experiments, but we do have one for green growth. It's South Korea. I don't know if you're familiar with the case. And to my understanding, it is the only one that is like massive scale. Like they had $10 billion stimulus package for like uh, 19 million green jobs. But the current understanding is that it largely failed. And I'm wondering if uh, your take, it, was it like a lack of seriousness, even though central government was involved? Was it a systematic issue of implementation? Uh, so, um, and it is like a, let's say, advanced capi capitalist country, which is similar to what you're referring to. Thank you. Would you like to answer or collect more questions, as you prefer? Hi, um, I have a more like philosophical question. Uh, it's about uh, your really, really strong thesis about the inbuilt desire for more of humans. Like, I would like you to better de develop this thesis, and especially I would like to ask you how you isolate social uh, like pressure or social elements from uh, 
like how you call it inbuilt um, desire and especially when you talk for example about fire do you that like differentiate a sort of need for survival from the desire for more then thank you by the way there is a great line by uh, paul simon who says uh, something like uh, the thought uh, uh, our life could be better is uh, uh, deeply ingrained into our hearts uh, and uh, and our uh, brains i think something like that you you may want to use it um other questions then you stop me when you <laughs> when you want to answer I'll okay, start answering, then, then and then we go uh, okay. on this side. Um, so a bunch of uh, testimony to the to the quality of the institution. Uh, I, I often feel I, I get always the same questions, and this time I didn't, which uh, which is a good thing. Um, on Francesco, on your point on uh, on capital being rewarded and the reward being far in time, and so things not sort of playing out or not working and the need for government. I, yes, uh, to a certain extent you have that, even though the, the, the sort of ch theory of change I have in mind is one that goes as follows, which is to say we have already um, people, a small cohort, but that is fine, within society, that is sort of willing to pay a green premium for uh, new green technologies. Um, and that is sort of all you need in the sense that I don't need the full conversion of everybody waking up tomorrow and thinking that uh, they're willing to devote their whole life uh, to the green transition. But you need a small cohort of, of early starters or early adopters and those uh, sort of uh, kickstart the process. Because if you have those, then you have firms that are attracted by the potential of selling uh, new green products to that cohort and make some profits. In the process, they become better at doing that. They walk down cost curves, and eventually we reach that price tipping point. And when we reach price parity or the price tipping point, that's when a new technology will start spreading throughout society. And at that point, I don't even need everybody to be on board on the green transition. To a certain extent, you could even not believe in climate change. And even just by following uh, uh, prices or convenience, you would end up adopting, I don't know, an electric vehicle rather than the internal combustion engine uh, alternative. The other thing that I would say is often, I, when I talk to companies, uh, they would often say, yeah, but this is, uh, is for the future. As a matter of fact, many of these things are happening at a speed that means uh, that the price parity moment is within reach, uh, as in uh, one, two, three, four years uh, out, not 20 years. So I'm not uh, saying you need to invest because rewards will come in 2050, uh, but rather within a very uh, short investment, uh, um, investment horizon. And the crucial point, uh, again, a, a point that I try to reiterate when talking to private sector actors is, bear in mind that you wanna try and be a leader rather than a follower. Because if you are a leader in developing and being at the frontier of these new technologies and you crack some of the fundamental elements, you develop a head start. And if you develop a head start, these are things that reverberate in economic terms for decades. If you think about it, and I'm sure you know, a lot of the car brands that we have in our mind, whether it is the Benz, or whether it is Daimler, whether it is Maybach, whether it is Porsche, these were engineers. These were people that were experimenting on the internal combustion engine at the, at the beginning of the last century. What does this suggest? It suggests that the fact that they became, there was a breakthrough early on, sort of gave a, an early push to a certain uh, country, technology, and know-how that to stay uh, for very long. And so you want to try and be the Porsche, Maybach and Daimler of the 21st century in a green, green flavor. Um, and that's why it is important to try and be a leader, even, uh, let's say, if you're focusing on profits narrowly and not doing the greater good, the greater the good, good of society, uh, and so on. So even a narrow focus on profits and making money is, uh, is a smart money in trying to be a leader on this, uh, on this field. Nonetheless, it's true that for some technologies, some technologies are still far from market. 
uh, and I'm thinking the classic example is aviation, another example often given is uh, uh, the production of cement or things like this that are not close to being uh, on the market. And because of that, uh, those are elements where you might want governments stepping in more and, and funding research, which is still at a basic uh, research level, let's say. Um, and so th that is an argument for, for government to intervene. Given you're asking uh, what I, how I see the role of government in innovation more broadly, and how this relates to the work of, of Mariana Mazzucato, I feel that uh, often uh, the literature I engage with is sort of uh, twisting uh, Mazzucato's arm uh, into making her say things she's not. As in, uh, she, in her books and her literature, is saying, ah, look, governments have a role, and look at the Apollo missions, look at DARPA in helping develop key innovations, and, you know, I have no problem with that. So recognizing that governments do have a role in fostering innovation is all fine and good, but stretching it to the extent of saying, ah, look, governments can do innovation on their own and alone, and they don't need private market forces is a step too far, which she doesn't make as an argument. And I would also, again, linking to what you were saying in terms of adoption, I would separate the development and the deployment of innovation. And I feel like governments are good, particularly in the first part, so in the development part where they can foster research and programs like Apollo missions and, and DARPA and so on. And, and you know, the, the classic example Mazzucato gives is say things like, ah, you look at your smartphone, everything that makes your smartphone smart was developed by DARPA, whether it is Siri, touch screen, GPS, the internet to a certain extent. But what makes the smartphone, the technology that developed at the fastest speed possibly in technological history, is the fact that then the private sector actors, whether it is Steve Jobs, and, and other providers later on sort of took this raw innovation, transformed it into something that was usable uh, by a consumer, and then uh, sort of the race between uh, different uh, uh, companies is what made it uh, available, usable, uh, fast, and to a certain extent cheap. And so I would separate between the two, between the two uh, dimensions. Then. Uh, the question on, uh, on the current growth stagnation uh, is a very good question. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, if you see, as I do, innovation and growth, long-term growth, because I'm not talking about GDP going up uh, in the third quarter by 0.4%. I'm not so much interested in that. I'm looking at the longer-term dimension. And, and when you do that, innovation and, and innovation capacity and growth are effectively the same thing. Um, and to my mind, uh, there, there is a whole discussion on whether innovation is slowing down. And scholars are sort of battling on whether innovation is slowing down, and you have the Robert Gordon view of the world, which sort of says, ah, innovation, the big innovation was in the uh, 20s, 30s, 40s. This was an unprecedented and impossible to repl replicate era of uh, uh, crucial technologies whether it was indoor plumbing, whether it was electricity, whether it was the telegraph, whether it was aviation, these were effectively technologies that changed completely the world and they can no longer be replicated. And so even the internet or whatnot, they're not gonna be able to replicate that. I mean, I see his point, but to, to a certain extent, I have a hard time seeing when you place them in, uh, in Again, in the long arc of history, I don't understand why that would be the end of technology and innovation uh, and, why, um, and why future technologies will not uh, be so as well. And, and as, again, what we're trying to do is uh, foster uh, an acceleration in innovation. So we should see that in uh, growth figures as well. A, a, a related debate is whether we're measuring growth in the right way. And so there are the... I think, what's his name, Eric uh, Brinjolfsson uh, um, at MIT, who says we're, measure, we're mismeasuring, in particular, the digital economy. And because we're mismeasuring that, we, we're sort of using the wrong indicator to measure growth. And that is what is explaining uh, this, uh, this stagnation. Um, yes, innovation, but it takes too long. I mean, uh, yes, and to a certain extent, it, this also um, moderates, perhaps, uh, you, you already called me, accused me of, uh, of optimism. 
Um, and this sort of moderates uh, that call in the sense of saying, look, um, I, I even receive students to my courses at the end of the course come to me and they're like, um, so are we gonna make it? I'm like, are we gonna make it what? As in climate change and fighting climate change is not, uh, is not the final of the World Cup, whether either you win or you lose, but rather it is a, a continuous uh, process and we're trying to achieve, we've set for ourselves some political goals to a certain extent. So at the intersection of climate change and politics, we agreed that 1.5 degrees Celsius above uh, uh, pre-industrial levels is, let's say, the political uh, goal we've given to ourselves, it is not optimal. So it's not like it's ideal that the te temperature has gone up by 1.5. And in any case, every, uh, every extra degree or, or tenth of a degree matters. So if we don't make it to 1.5, staying below 1.6 is better than 1.7, which is better than 1.8, and so on. And effectively, what is going to be is going to be a battle between a changing climate, which is already happening, uh, and technology that is being developed. And it is the, the interplay of this horse race that will determine effectively the type of world we live in and the extent to which we will, let's say, uh, scarcity will materialize uh, or technology will, uh, will help us address this, uh, both in mitigation and, uh, and adaptation. So the faster we are, the better. Um, but, uh, and so that, that's, uh, that would be my, my answer. On South Korea, I have to say, I'm not uh, an expert enough to comment on what went wrong. Uh, with their with their experiment, I love uh, the philosophical question. So I'm all for uh, philosophy and philosophical questions. Um, I am told at times that I that I go into the high grass too much with the philosophy in the book. So I'm glad that somebody <laughs> appreciates or might appreciate. Um, and I think that it's a very good question. Um, and you're saying, okay, but how do we isolate uh, the social dimension? To a certain extent, I don't, which is why I bring in the, the sociology component, which is to say, uh, in part, the desire for more um, does originate from uh, um, a, an emulation effect, and an emulation effect in the sense that you have uh, the, the richer, the most successful, the whatever, however you you call prestige and define prestige, and prestige has been defined in different ways throughout different eras. Uh, maybe now it's uh, Messi, and before it was the emperor. To my mind, it's irrelevant, but there is, uh, let's say, people who adopt initial uh, behaviors, and then there is uh, a sort of imitation effect that is, uh, that is uh, inbuilt. Um, and so you have an interplay of wanting to stand out and wanting to fit in. So, uh, uh, um, an advanced cohort that adopts behaviors or new things or new objects to signal status and prestige, and uh, a set of followers that effectively imitate. It is the intersection of these two dynamics that to my mind and to a certain extent um, determine this cost, constant uh, uh, desire for more. Uh, which we have seen throughout uh, different societies. So again, it is not something that started with uh, consumerism, with hyper-consumerism, with uh, after the Second World War um, or the First Industrial Revolution. Uh, it is something that uh, we have seen uh, throughout. Uh, whereas uh, I, I very much like this idea of uh, do we want to separate between, uh, let's say, the need for survival, and so needs that are real needs, uh, and uh, wants that are, uh, you know, the want of the moment and doesn't really matter. And to a certain extent, what I try to say there is, this is a very strong point that gets raised in the sense that people say, yeah, look, we have, we rich world or rich countries sort of have reached uh, the necessities of life, whether it is uh, the capacity of, uh, of, of eating enough, or whether it is having a shelter or whatnot. Um, and therefore, we should be happy with what we have because we have fulfilled our needs and everything else, the extra growth we generate, goes into useless crap uh, that is, uh, that is uh, non-needs uh, non or wants. And what I try to, to do there is to say, look, again, if you go throughout history, uh, what we consider needs right now were wants uh, or what would have been uh, incredible desires to have in previous eras. What we consider wants now, access to 
clean water, access to warm water, uh, access to heating at home, um, and so on, are all things that the richest of the richest uh, 500 years ago would not have uh, had access to. Uh, access to medical treatments uh, like, uh, uh, like painkillers or like antibiotics uh, would, have, uh, would have been uh, the, a great luxury uh, 200 years ago, and now we consider that if you don't have access to these things, uh, you are in misery and you're beyond uh, uh, or below basic needs. And so that this idea that a need of what is a need and what is a want is sort of determined by what is available and what is possible and what is made possible by science, technology, and know-how. And so it is the very development of science uh, that makes, that opens the scope of possibilities that then determines what is, uh, what is a want initially, typically expensive, and when the, the richer cohorts have it and something starts to spread, we transform something that was a want into something that we consider basic uh, uh, need. Uh, and that's okay, that. so some more questions. And I, I, I have to say I'm quite relieved that uh, everybody struggles with pronouncing Bryn Johnson and not just me. I, uh, and, yeah, I don't know uh, yeah, so how to approach uh, that name. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, my question arises from uh, the following observation. Uh, recently, the mix, uh, the interaction between digital technologies and green technologies uh, made possible to uh, innovative ways uh, of uh, innovative ownership ways, collective ownership ways. For example, people uh, putting together money and owning uh, an energy production plant and using that energy coming from solar. Uh, energy, for, for instance. Uh, in your idea of the green uh, revolution, green industrial revolution, is there a relevant place for collecting new ways, new innovative ways of collecting ownerships, or is private property still the dominant mm. paradigm of capitalism? Thank you. Okay, good morning. Thank you for your... <coughs> Sorry. Thank you for your presentation. A couple of questions. Um, first of all, reshaping capitalism is something that can be done, let's say, at least thought, either very political ways of doing that, so EU Commission uh, and US or whatever try to do that, or from the counter, si counter side, let's say, entrepreneurs, they move, they decide all together to move to a, let's say, to a green path somehow and um, foster investment there. Do you believe that, okay, Maybe it's a spoiler of the book, I have no idea, but the right way is one or the other, or is a mix of the two, and if, if, those, if so, how? Right. And finally, since you are in a technical school today, what is your call to action to, let's say, all of us? Love it. Coming. <coughs> Thank you for your uh, very stimulating presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you if you consider the, um, I mean, the political dimension of innovation in this uh, domain, because I, I heard that you, you've been speaking about governance of innovation and uh, in a kind of way of, uh, uh, let's say, the relation between uh, uh, governs a different kind of, that could be national governments or national governments and technological innovation. But I'm, I'm very, and, and that's also a, a more specific question about, uh, for example, uh, uh, talking about the European Union policies also in face of, you know, the new development of European Union. Next year we are going to have European election and so probably we are going to face a big change in that. So. What about, uh, I mean, the political impact hmm, of the innovation you were uh, talking about and how, you know, maybe national government and you government could face that, you know, because uh, I can share your optimistic view and uh, I can agree in, uh, in, a, in a certain measure of the, uh, let's say, the need uh, of this kind of innovation. At the times, your vision, it seems to me a little bit uh, inevitabilistic in a, in for certain points. 
And, and so um, I'm not an economist, I'm a social scientist. So I, I'm very curious about you know, your reflection about the political impact of that. Uh, there are some more questions. Would you like to answer now <laughs> or get more, collect more questions? I can. I don't know how. I, I, I'll, I'll try to answer. We'll see. We have about 20 okay. minutes left. 20, okay, yeah. We can do another. I'll, I'll answer and then we do another round. Okay. Um, so on green and digital, um, I, I, it, it's interesting because I, I feel like there is a, I suspect there is a chat GPT effect in the sense that I started presenting this book uh, around May Nobody was asking me digital questions or the interplay between digital and, and green. And then over the past few months, uh, I often hear this, uh, this idea of, of people asking me, okay, but how does, the, how does AI or the digital uh, AI big data or the digital uh, uh, transformation affect the green transition? What is the, what is the interplay between these uh, two uh, mega trends? And my, my answer there, without being an expert of the, of the digital transition, is to say, uh, if, if you believe, as I believe, that this is a very, to a certain extent, we will be using innovation to sort of manage the challenge, whether it is uh, scaling down the use of uh, materials, whether it is decarbonizing products or processes and so on, uh, digital falls within this uh, setting of, uh, or category, as in to say it is one of the most advanced uh, technologies and approaches we have and we will be using a kitchen sink approach to this massive problem of climate change. Thereby, we will be using everything we have, or the most advanced knowledge we have. This includes the digital domain. And specifically to your question, I perfectly see uh, a, a greater use of sharing, for example, or the sharing economy, meaning, again, that you're improving the, uh, uh, the material efficiency while getting the same service. So if we were to have uh, you know, a, great, a, a very well-oiled uh, system of uh, uh, car sharing of, of sort, I could perfectly see how you are servicing the same need, which is what people ultimately care about. So the, servicing, uh, the service, bringing them from point A to B, and if we do that uh, with, uh, with a sharing type of setting, so be it. And digital can help make that happen. And I think we will be using a lot of that. I was telling you I was at, uh, at ETH last week and, and they were the, the lab I was talking to uses digital technologies to improve circularity of buildings. So using uh, uh, yeah, effectively digital technologies, uh, uh, digital replicas, uh, blockchain technology to sort of track uh, the materials that are in buildings and so on to help then deconstruct them and reuse the material. So using digital technology to, uh, to improve circularity goes along uh, those dimensions of saying digital is not the solution to the problem. It is one of the ways that we will try to, to attack the problem, one of the many. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think that this is uh, in any way circumventing uh, core principles of capitalism where ownership needs to be in, any si in every single object and so on. Um, your, your question on, uh, on reshaping capitalism, uh, whether this is a private endeavor or a government uh, mission, to a certain extent, I mean, I see, to my mind, uh, uh, businesses will play maybe the central, the most central of roles as part of the green uh, transformation, in part because I believe that that is where most of the innovation will happen, and particularly the deployment phase, which I, I, I suspect is, uh, is the one where we need to accelerate enormously. And so it is very much a, a business-centric approach. At the same time, I don't, I am less uh, reliant on uh, uh, businesses transforming completely their governance and uh, doing a Patagonia move, uh, creating their fund for climate change and so on. Uh, but rather to my mind, as I was sort of hinting in, in previous answers, I am perfectly fine with businesses continuing to do business while realizing that there are huge business opportunities in the green transition and that if you are not seizing them, you're doing dumb business. Um, and so that, that is a bit the, the approach I have in mind. Whereas the, the reshaping of capitalism I was, uh, I was mentioning in the book or the subtitle of the book is more, relates more to the public dimension 
which is to say we have uh, grown up or were born in your case, in our case in an era where capitalism was associated with certain features whether it was small government whether it was unfettered free trade whether it was uh, um, yeah, minimal regulation or whatnot but what I try to argue in the book is to say, look, there's nothing embedded in capitalism that requires these things. And actually, as a matter of fact, first you observe varieties of capitalism from the Japanese alternative to the Swedish to the American, um, which display different extenses of these, on, these, uh, on these domains. And even when focusing on one nation, the, the capitalism of the Reagan era in the US is not uh, the one of, uh, of Roosevelt, in, uh, in the 40s and 50s. And so to a certain extent, we will need a stronger role of government, uh, and that is fine. And we need it particularly to sort of reorient or, or get the incentives straight early on. Uh, but to my mind, it is a phase. And uh, in the same way we have, we have seen phases, now we are in a phase where larger public investments will be needed, probably yes. Larger redistribution or insurance against uh, increasing uh, uh, extreme weather events, yes. Uh, greater investment in research or using industrial policy for uh, fostering research, like the Inflation Reduction Act, yes. Uh, will this have repercussions on globalization? Probably yes. Uh, as, the, as, the, as the New York Times was saying yesterday, um, we need it, and to a certain extent, uh, uh, the overarching goal of avoiding a climate catastrophe is probably more important than uh, safeguarding uh, globalization rules uh, or the World, uh, World Trade Organization rules, uh, per se. Uh, the call to action, I, 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 love, this, uh, I love this question. I, uh, I'll keep it for the end. I'll, I'll keep the call to action for the, as the final remark. Um, the political dimension, um, I am not, so the, how should I put it? There is one political dimension, which is to say the what sort of what I was hinting in the presentation, which is to say this technological transformation will have political repercussions on people, um, and we will have to manage that process because if not, uh, uh, we will sort of have uh, the population oppose uh, the transformation, and uh, and we should not uh, we should avoid that, and uh, and therefore this implies not leaving uh, swathes of people behind or regions left behind. Uh, and so on. So there is that dimension. And then there is the sort of the arrow going the other way around. So the politics influencing uh, the speed of the green transformation. You were hinting at the European elections coming up. Um, and all I'm saying to a certain extent is we've got to keep uh, incentives, uh, individual incentives in mind. Um, and what I'm trying to track is, an, is, a, is a green transition that is incentive compatible and that is in the interest, that has some uh, direct personal interests, whether it is for, uh, for industry groups, uh, for countries, um, to, try and, uh, to, uh, to try and accelerate it and move away from this uh, uh, narrative, which is we are doing it in the interest of a greater good, in the interest of our future generations, of our children and grandchildren. We do it before ethical terms uh, and so on. I don't think that that is a political message that would work, and rather what I'm trying to argue is uh, use a message that to a certain extent a lot of this transformation will come with direct benefits, uh, often with direct benefits to the population as well, as in uh, it comes with co-benefits in terms of breathability of air, in terms of uh, uh, noise pollution, in terms of uh, a variety of, uh, of factors, and even in terms of creation of jobs. And so that the green transition can generate jobs to a certain extent, conversely, from, from the digital uh, revolution that is very prone to these very strong agglomeration effects where you have a very few platform or players uh, servicing the whole world. So you have these uh, islands of uh, high skill, uh, high pay in a sea of, uh, of unemployment. <laughs> Um, the green transition on the surface of it initially is a huge infrastructure project which will generate jobs and, and later on is also a, a huge uh, um, sort of uh, yeah, attending to this infrastructure uh, which is uh, something that uh, will be hard to delocalize. Um, and I love uh, your question on determinism, because indeed it's something that I've been uh, struggling with uh, sort of internally. 
because indeed when you are exposed to studying the long arcs of, of history or past civilizations and so on, you are to a certain extent uh, uh, exposed to falling prey to some type of determinism, as in saying, look, forces, uh, long-term long forces sort of push uh, the course of history in a certain direction, um, which is uh, something that, I, that I'm starting indeed to, starting to believe, while at the same time realizing that policy has a role. So it's not to say, you know, everything will happen because it must happen, but some things will happen because they are in the long arc of history, and we are sort of, uh, as policymakers, we are, we are sort of working with these guardrails of, of the larger forces of, uh, of history determined by the way the climate is changing and so on. Um, I don't know if you want to take a few more questions. Yes, two uh, more quick questions and two quick answers. And uh, uh, by the way, Alessio was mentioning, I mean, the impact on globalization. Uh, just to remind you that in Turin from June the 1st to June the 4th, there will be the uh, Festival Internazionale dell'Economia, the Inter International Festival of Economics, that this year with Danny Roderick and, uh, and Darren Asemoglu and many others, and uh, uh, this year it will be devoted, the theme will be rethinking globalization. Uh, First of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is regarding your uh, last part of your presentation. Uh, you said that, if I'm not wrong, you said that innovation and technology will somehow help the need. Will. But uh, if uh, we know, when we are thinking about innovation, we are thinking about new paradigms. And you know that uh, about new paradigms is not just a new technology, new innovation. There are some other players that they are playing their role. One of them is what is already in place that it can help to complete our innovation. For example, for making clear my, my question, I want to mention something about uh, history. When uh, th they were, many people begin to work on uh, building cars in the beginning. They were, uh, all the people that has garage, they begin to uh, build some sort of carts and uh, Nikola Tesla was one of them, and as you may predict, uh, the car that uh, he built was electric car. But since in that era there were some products of oil, people refused it. To, but now they are going back, they are going uh, towards the electric cars. So uh, I want you, if it is possible, to uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. and. Uh, the question also is that uh, how we can make sure that we may, we may not make the same mistake again. Uh, because, yeah, m we make innovation, something is in the favor of us, but uh, maybe something is good and we reject it. Thank you. Cheers. And there was one last question. Yes, my question and remark uh, concerns the hard side of the problem of growth, uh, be it uh, green or blue or gray, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, uh, when you want to produce anything, um, an object or a service, uh, uh, you uh, must pour in energy or matter, kilograms and joules. Well, if everything has to grow, uh, the produ uh, pro production grows, uh, costs grow faster. And this is physics. I mean, if you want as a product speed, velocity, you have to put energy, and the energy, kinetic energy, grows with the square of the speed, grows faster. If you want in a circuit have to uh, increase the current, well, of course, you have to pour in energy, but the energy you have to pour in grows with the square of, of uh, the speed. So the result is that the difference between the product and the cost, material cost, uh, for a while, it uh, grows also, and everything, the advantage grows, it's okay, but you reach uh, some point where uh, abruptly uh, the advantage uh, uh, drops uh, to becoming even negative. So this is a global problem uh, we, uh, uh, which we should have to face. How to do? What to do? So, um, it's great that you are... Uh, seven, minutes. seven minutes, okay. Uh, so it's great that you're mentioning the, the car example because indeed it is an example that is mentioned in the book itself. And so to say, look, 
at the beginning of the car era in the early 1900s, there were effectively three technologies that were competing neck and neck. One was electric, you mentioned it, one was uh, internal combustion engine, and the other was uh, steam. And, uh, and eventually, um, it, you know, at the beginning, uh, Manhattan had a service of taxis that was based on electric. It was an uh, exchange of batteries, so you would leave one uh, flat and uh, get a new battery and, and sort of have that exchange. It was perfectly functional. Uh, eventually, oil prevailed. And the question there is, why did oil prevail? And the reason, or what I argue in the book is, look, it had some features that were considered favorable, positive, for the fact, uh, for example, uh, autonomy. And there were other features that were considered less relevant than we consider them today. So for example, the exhaustion was considered as a minor nuisance in part because there was no knowledge uh, or concern about climate change. And in terms of local pollution, uh, this was an era in which people had been used to live uh, and survive with, uh, with horse manure uh, around the cities, with dead horses every so often. So it's, it's, uh, it was still considered an improvement with respect to what was there before. And this is important because it suggests once more that, yes, indeed, had we taken the electric option back then, now maybe we would not be in the situation we are right now. Um, but technology responds uh, in a way to what I was saying, which is uh, what is considered a need uh, or a priority of the moment. At the time, the priority was not reducing CO2 emissions or reducing local uh, point exhaust, um, whereas uh, it is now. And, and this idea that, you know, technologies and often technologies that we're going to use now are not new is again a testament to what I was saying. Uh, solar panels, you probably know better than I do, are not a recent technology. Uh, we are rolling them out because now it's considered a priority to achieve a certain goal, but they were around, uh, they were invented in the late 1800s. At that point, it was a science experiment. So yes, we had it, it was uh, curious, and then we put it away and it disappeared. It reappears in the 1950s when we need to power um, satellites, artificial satellites. So then again, there is a need, you use them. But then again, it's a niche technology, so you don't roll it out. So it, it is sort of the interplay between, uh, yeah, something you, you have, but then it needs to serve uh, a purpose in that moment. And to a certain extent, um, that often the technologies we use to solve the problem of the moment often generate the next problem that we have down the line. Uh, but this is uh, the way it is. So yes, it is true that uh, you know while moving uh, to cities or generate uh, developing agriculture and uh, having urbanization, this sort of created pestilence or the, the presence of epidemies, yes. And then we try to address that. And when, when you address that, you're generating the next problem and you're sort of proceeding in that way. Uh, but I don't think we're reaching that point of, of the end of, uh, of solving all problems at once, which I feel, again, is, is what uh, some of uh, the people I often disagree with would say. Uh, related to the second point, um, which uh, I'm very wary of answering <laughs> uh, without uh, the engineering background, but uh, to a certain extent, and let's see if I answer the question, uh, and if not, we can, we can chat about it uh, after, after the lecture. I am often at odds with engineers on some of these topics because, again, they tell me, you know, energy, you're using energy to generate more, to create more, and at the end of the day, for example, some of the arguments I have with uh, uh, Jean-Marc Jancovici, so an engineer in France, uh, he, the argument he says is, you know, we're moving away from fossil fuels, fossil fuels, uh, the, the renewable alternative is less energy dense, it is more expensive at the end of the day, it is less abundant and so on. So this is the end of cheap energy, therefore it is the end of growth, let's say. And to my mind, uh, this one-to-one -one relationship between growth and energy use is, uh, is a bit odd uh, in the sense that what we're trying to do is, uh, is service needs, and I, what I would call generate value. But generate value is not necessarily stuff. And, and to my mind, if you can generate that value, 
our colleague earlier was mentioning the sharing economy as one example, but there are many to say you can actually reduce energy consumption while generating more value for more people. And to use, to use figures, if, if we look at primary energy consumption of, of rich countries over the past 20 years, it's effectively flat. It's more or plus or one percent. GDP went up by 60 percent. Uh, if we look at last year, energy crisis, uh, 2022 energy crisis, uh, we effectively cut off methane from Russia, methane prices went up. Um, at the European level, methane consumption was down 17%. Industrial production, more or less flat, plus or minus 1%. What does this suggest is that you can reinvent processes to make them more efficient, generate the same value, while keeping energy consumption similar or even reducing it. And so there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between value creation and energy or material use as a matter of, of fact. And finally, in the final uh, minute, uh, the call to action is, is to a certain extent that I am, uh, I'm doing a lot of the talking or to a certain extent framing an effort in terms of innovation that however it, it requires uh, you guys so it requires the technical schools, it requires people developing the actual innovations, and I'm making it easy. You were mentioning, I'm, I'm sort of uh, taking a, a deterministic approach, these things will happen. Uh, they will, but they do, and they historically happen, because people are constantly pushing the frontier of what is possible. And, uh, in a, and when I say, you know, we're walking down cost curves, uh, this happens because engineers uh, work hard day and night within companies to improve processes and make them more efficient. So these things don't happen magically. I'm just saying that it is possible, but it requires your efforts, and your efforts are crucial to a certain extent and without too much rhetoric for the future of uh, humanity on this planet. So keep up the good work. Thank you very much.